When Ebola first hit uh, Sierra Leone, um, it was in late May, and we were already on the ground um, there studying another infectious disease called loss of fever, which is very similar to Ebola. And so as the outbreak started uh, in May, we quickly shifted our focus to emergency response. And some of these efforts included supplying laboratory supplies and reagents so that the Kenema Hospital could safely and effectively diagnose uh, Ebola. And so as a part of this effort, we sequenced 99 full-length genomes from uh, Ebola patients, and there were a total of 78 patients that we sequenced from over the first three weeks of the outbreak. And so this information really provides uh, some important data on the origin and transmission of Ebola virus in Sierra Leone. The study came about really in a very unique fashion. Um, unlike many disease investigations, we did not seek out this virus. This outbreak came to us, to our field site, where we have uh, a team of international scientists who are already doing studies on diseases like Ebola. When Ebola first entered Sierra Leone, the lab in Kenema was prepared to do the testing. They were ready. And Augustine Goba, one of the first authors on our paper, diagnosed the first case of Ebola virus in Sierra Leone. We then returned in July to help optimize the diagnostic testing and um, communicate our preliminary findings with health leaders in the country. It's important to reiterate that without our long-term and inter international collaborations in Sierra Leone, none of this work would have been possible. We're able to describe how the virus got from Guinea into Sierra Leone in late May. And since that time, it picked up a number of new mutations pretty quickly. And we're able to use that uh, to identify just the way it's moved around within the country since that time. Um, the mutations uh, fall in these certain patterns where the new ones fall on top of the background of the old mutations. And we can use that to infer which viruses descended from other previous viruses and, and kind of thus figure out which patients may have actually uh, infected other patients. This gives us a much clearer picture of how the virus got around, you know, moving between countries from Guinea to Sierra Leone, how it moved around within the country from town to town, from chiefdom to chiefdom, and even just which patients may have infected other patients. And this is all just based on genetic data. It ends up agreeing a lot with the epidemiology that the Sierra Leoneans were able to figure out themselves using kind of the traditional methods, knocking on doors, contact tracing. We really believe that this study uh, sets a precedent for how sequencing can be used during an outbreak response. And it's still sort of not very well known how sequencing can inform the epidemiology of infectious diseases. And so we really hope that this study helps to bridge that gap. Um, Sequencing now can be done very cheaply and rapidly, uh, and it can be integrated into existing systems uh, throughout the world. One of the key things that, that we need to figure out is that we had all this initial three-week period uh, where we sequenced everything. We, we basically saw that the virus was changing. The question is, where is it now? Because we haven't sequenced anything from the virus for over the last couple of months, so we don't actually know how the virus has changed during that period. And then finally, we should also say that we, we, we have found many changes in this current strain of, of, of Ebola as a year. And the question is, we know that the changes are there, but we don't know whether there are any functional consequences. For all we know, the virus is exactly the same as what we've seen before. But it might be that some of these individual changes are actually causing some sort of difference in the virus. So I think trying to understand if any of these individual changes have an effect on the function of the virus is going to be important. And also importantly, because these changes are there, do these have any effects on you know, vaccines, therapies, and also diagnostics? That's also something that I think we need to start to address. The Broad has really played a vital role in this whole process. And the viral genome platform at the Broad has really uh, been developed on other infectious diseases like loss of fever, dengue fever, and HIV. And so we really piggybacked on these same uh, platforms that were already being used for other diseases, and it allowed us to rapidly uh, sequence and push this information uh, to the scientific community. Uh, and so we published all of this data as it came off the sequencers, and we've really had a great response from the scientific community. Um, and they've already been in contact with us about follow-up studies. And so we really hope that this can be used as a model moving forward for future and ongoing outbreaks. This is a serious epidemic with a significant human cost. 
and we very unfortunately lost five of our co-authors to this disease, including the head physician at the hospital, Dr. Humar Khan. On a very personal level, it has motivated us to make our findings as practical and timely and useful as possible to the people who are on the front lines.